Now, I, I'd like to introduce and welcome our speaker. Um, Elizabeth, or Liz Hathaway, currently lives and works in Amsterdam, but she was born in a beautiful part of Britain, uh, the valleys of South Wales. And um, she has studied astrology deeply for more than 40 years. She's extremely well qualified uh, in several fields within it. Uh, Liz has published articles on mundane astrology in leading astrological journals. She's an independent researcher and she has a special interest in rituals, sacred space, shamanism, magic and transformation. And you can find out more about her at her webpage, which I'll post in a short while again on the chat. Um, Liz has lectured all over in the Netherlands, in the UK, in Belgium, in India, and we're absolutely delighted, Liz, that you've accepted our invitation tonight. Um, I'm really looking forward to the talk tonight. Um, it's entitled uh, The Discovery of Pluto, her story, what would Persephone say? And I don't want to steal her thunder, but I know it's going to be a really interesting perspective on the discovery of Pluto and to a certain extent, the other um, outer planets as well. So thank you so much uh, for coming along tonight, uh, Liz, and joining us. And um, I, I invite you to share your screen with us and to begin your talk whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you for the invite, Christine, to speak today. And um, I'm going to dive straight in because I have quite a lot of material to share. Um, so this, uh, the main course of this uh, talk today is the horoscope or the discovery chart and the emergence of the sacred feminine, which started to gather momentum as Pluto arrived. But um, before getting to the main course, I think we're going to make a little sort of journey through, um, you know, the backstory here. What is the backstory? And I think what we, uh, well, what I find interesting anyway, is that as the outer planets arrive, we start to see um, something happening within the psyche, which involves a sort of new voice, if you like, or a new consciousness um, for women. And if we start with Uranus, the typical sort of things that we associate with Uranus is, of course, the Enlightenment and the revolution, French and American, this idea of rebellion and seeing with different eyes and breakthrough and new discovery, the Industrial Revolution and all of the... A disruption to the countryside and the move to the cities that went with it. But when we think of where women were, their position in society at this point, the whole sort of, you know, the, the most important thing for uh, genteel women certainly was the ability to find a decent husband. A good example, which is a bit later, but would be like Pride and Prejudice, this idea of woman as womb, woman as yeah, I mean, children, home life. It was all about this ability to, to marry and to find the right partner, the right man. So women had no rights. They had no rights to property. They had no right to an education uh, or couldn't go to university. They had no rights at all, actually. Rape within marriage was not a crime. And a man was expected to beat his wife because she needed to be disciplined and he had to keep his wife in place. So this was the sort of um, setting around the discovery, if you like, of uh, Uranus, which was in uh, 1781. So this is the discovery chart for uh, Uranus. And there are a few things in this chart that I want to point out because it replicates in all three of the discovery charts of the outer planets. Firstly, it's the position of the moon. In all three of the outer planets, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, we'll find the moon, tradition, which is signed traditionally of fall. So this is the place for um, the moon, if you like. Certainly, if you look at it from a 
sort of patriarchal point of view or a masculine point of view and look at it within the perspective of the astrology we inherited from the Greek and uh, the ancient world. You know, women were, yeah, they were expected to know their place. They were expected to be genteel. And, you know, if you think of a moon in Scorpio, this is a dark moon. This is Erish Kegel rather than Inanna. You know, there's a fierceness in the moon in Scorpio. There's a sort of anger in there. There's a sort of almost a repressed rage in a way. And when we look at this chart, what's very striking about it is the Uranus-Saturn opposition, Mars-Uranus opposition. So you can feel an enormous restlessness, uh, you know, in the mind, in the, in the society, things are changing. And the opposition of Uranus to Saturn and Mars conjunct is square the sun. And if we think of the sun in terms of, you know, the status quo, the, 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 the main story, if you like, God, the, the father, you know, this energy that's coming in, this new order of being, Saturn, Uranus, it's threatening or challenging this Mars, uh, sorry, the sun in Pisces. And if we notice in this chart as well, Venus in Pisces, this is exactly the same position as Venus holds in the Pluto discovery chart. So there's a lot of similarities also the North Node, South Node. So there's a lot of resonance between uh, these charts. So we have here, which is replicated in the Pluto discovery chart. We have this moon in fall, which traditionally is seen as, you know, not the best place for the moon, right? And we have an exalted Venus. Venus is this, um, yeah, truly, you know, woman on a pedestal sort of thing. And into this sort of a cauldron of new ideas and change arrives this uh, amazing woman who was so ahead of her time. Uh, she, she just fills me with admiration. She really does. Um, she was um, a genteel woman. She was well educated, as was her sister, but her family had no money. So her role in life really was going to be that of a governess, because that's what women of her position who had no dowry or no, you know, no money, they had no real opportunity on the marriage market. So, um, you know, th these were women that were going to become governesses or teachers at schools for genteel women. Not that there were a lot of them, I don't think, at this time at all. But... Mary Wollstonecraft, as you can see, she has a beautiful mutual reception between Venus and Mercury. And she was a woman, Mars in Aries as well, square Jupiter, don't fence me in. She was a real rebellious kind of character. And she's born, uh, this is a noon chart, by the way, or so a midnight chart, don't have the time for her, but she is born on this new moon in Taurus around that new moon, as was Karl Marx, by the way. So there's something about laying a fundament, something solid in new moons in Taurus that can really lay the bedrock or the groundwork or something. So she led an amazing life. She, when the French Revolution broke out, she journeyed to Paris because by this time she was earning a living through her writing. She'd done a stint as a governess and started translating and discovered that she could earn a living through her pen. So she went to France, there she fell in love with a bit of a cad, got pregnant, he didn't want to marry her. She had to flee uh, France because of the, the bloody aftermath of the revolution. And she manages to get back to Britain. She has her daughter, her first child out of wedlock, uh, but was born somewhere in France. So she led this incredibly um, non-conventional lifestyle, which for women at that time, it was just, she broke all the rules. And she also has a Pluto Uranus square. So the challenge that she's making to the status quo, now actually, as you can see, Uranus is just about to change sign as well, is, is she's really going to shake things up. She has that ability. And of course, her book, The Vindication of the Rights of Women, a woman, sorry, Pluto out of bounds. We know this is the date that she submitted the end, the last page of her manuscript to the printer it was the 3rd of January, 1792, Sun Saturn Square. So, and it was like actually the moon back in Taurus, if you think of her, you know, sort of sun moon conjunction. 
So this book, The Vindication of the Rights of Women, it attacked the fawning, the sort of feeble way that women just, you know, powdered themselves and tried to be like flowers to attract bees. She was highly critical of, you know, the role that women were allowed to play in society. And if you like, she started a conversation among, you know, genteel women and women of the middle and upper classes. So she was a, an incredibly um, exciting person to be born around that time. And of course, her daughter, Mary um, Shelley, was the writer of uh, Lord Frankenstein. So she was, she was her husband, she did eventually marry, was uh, one of the founders of the anarchist movement in the UK. So she was just out there doing something completely different. If we look at the discovery of Neptune, which was the next shall we say, planet to, um, you know, that, that was made visible, if you like, or revealed itself, and the kind of things that were going on that we recognise, you know, the origin of the species, the birth of Sigmund Freud, the Communist Manifesto, you know, there's all sorts of things, once again, a sort of, what's the word, um, bubbling underneath the surface. Things are actually moving again, the cauldron is being stirred in a way. And this is what we see then moving, you know, one step from where Mary Wollstonecraft found herself. We see the early phase of the women's suffragette movement, votes for women starting to, um, you know, the call for that. But still at this time, women were denied most legal rights. They were unable to vote or own property or keep their wages or have custody of their children. But just two years after Neptune's discovery, the first public demand for legal gender equality, this is in the UK, was made. So things around the whole issue of what it means to be a woman and woman's role and position in society is once again um, taking, if you like, a, a, a big step forward away from the kitchen, away from you know, that traditional rule, um, role of woman as womb. And what we also see is the start of the, well, the beginning of spiritualism. If you remember, this was in New York, the Fox sisters, the plopper, you know, that sort of banging sounds. And this was something, you know, as well after the Civil War, where there were a lot of, you know, a lot of loss of life. And after the First World War, again, you know, this really mediumship, spiritual, spiritualism, you know, the desire to make contact with the dead or souls that had departed was really um, was was really sort of sort of, yeah just it was booming at this at, after these events these events where there was major loss of life. So if we look at the uh, Neptune discovery chart, once again we see the moon is in Scorpio. It's once again so all of these outer planets they are somehow kind of kind of catching this sort of, you know, this, this, this disowned part of most of, of, of women, you know, the, 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 the sort of fierceness that Scorpio can have. So again, we see in this chart, we are moving again, the zeitgeist, if you like, is starting to change, Saturn, Neptune, you know, that conjunction coming in there. And it's in the eighth house, so we're thinking of things like fears and phobias and addiction, of course, and imagery and romanticism this was the start of the whole romantic movement it's got a very mysterious very paranormal sort of feel to it and neptune of course undermines saturn this is a very difficult marriage if you like a marriage of opposites because saturn is all about the ground under your feet and solid edifices well as neptune represents that sort of power of water to erode and to destroy structure and to undermine it so it's a difficult marriage and, and in in the eighth house this sort of watery house in a way so it's all about you know earthing the imaginary in a way and and liz green talks about the invisible underpinnings of physical reality when saturn and neptune come together saturn is very very strong here in its own sign this is structure in society and we have jupiter closely square to um, Mercury in its own sign. So we've got this confusion of tongues in a way. You know, there's a lot of, because um, Jupiter rules the ninth house. 
So that's like maybe old style spirituality, you know, the God, if you like, as opposed to the third house, the goddess. So we can see that, you know, Darwin's origin of the species, all of these things that are starting to happen now are challenging or directly challenging the established um, idea of God the Father, if you like, Jupiter in Gemini. So the person who, the woman, if you like, who seems to be encapsulating all of this um, new uh, energy that is surfacing is, of course, Helena Blavatsky, a very famous um, leader of, the, and, and not only leader, founder uh, of the uh, uh, Theosophical Society, which, you know, had an enormous impact also on astrology because Alan Leo was a theosophist and there were branches of the Theosophy Society, Theosophical Society around the globe. So, you know, ideas could you know, spread through the whole organization, if you like. So it was, it was a bit like, you know, ancient Rome, you know, things that Christianity, things can fl flow when there's all these branches to a tree that spread around the world. So she was a Russian, of course, was, these are words that are used to describe her. She was apparently a very enigmatic person, very mysterious, very aristocratic. I mean, she has a son, North Node in Leo, um, interestingly, you know, she has this sort of Jupiter-Uranus conjunction in Aquarius in the 8th house. And in her case, it was all about the invisible teachers that um, she, she claimed to have. You know, the Mahatmas, Neptune is set in, Neptune is angular. And we know angular planets really, um, you know, manifest. You know, it, it, they are clearly um, expressing themselves in the world and are able to express in the world. And um, there's no water in her chart. She has only got a water ascendant, uh, a, a cancer rising. But the chart is, is full of beginnings, if you like. There's seven conjunctions in this chart. You know, the sun, the node, Mercury is with Saturn, Mercury with, uh, with Mars, Saturn with Mars, Saturn with Mercury, Jupiter, Uranus, Venus, Moon. So there's a huge amount of... Um, start energy and her chart resonates as well very strongly with the Neptune discovery chart if you look at that you know bunch of planets in Virgo Libra in Neptune discovery chart and then you look at Blavatsky's chart we see in the same sort of Virgo um, Libra sort of uh, emphasis then she's got Pluto in the 10th opposite um, opposite the moon so she was quite, you know, she's been, she was accused, as I said, of being a fraudster. Um, you know, she, she, she had a lot of attacks made on her person. And she deliberately as well refused to be um, known in a way. She never, to everyone, she presented something different. So she was unknowable. And that mystique about her, I think, is very Neptunian. So, you know, the ideas of Blavatsky, I mean, immense, you know, she uh, had the idea of the, you know, this universal divine principle, which was sexless and formless, um, you know, positive, negative spirit, matter, masculine, feminine. Uh, and she was really, you know, tuned into this idea of the higher self, this unconditional soul, which was understood to be neither male or female, so she, she was uh, this sort of divine hermaphrodite, uh, the sixth root race. So it was an occult explosion as Neptune manifested. We had this new uh, religion, theosophy, which brought the ideas of Hinduism, and especially to astrology later, we would have the ideas of um, karma, reincarnation. It's an ancestor of Wicca, which we start to see with 20th century with Pluto, but it's the backstory, if you like. And there's very, very close links between the Theosophical Society and the ongoing struggle for female emancipation, because it's like the pyramid of Maslow. If you haven't got basic things, you know, spiritual things are the higher point. So if we haven't got, if women didn't have the base there, you know, like the rights, the, the right to education, the right for, you know, to lead your own life, to, to make choices, own property. You know, as we go higher up the pyramid, then we get to the spiritual stuff. But Neptune, because of its 
potential, you know, thinking of that Saturn Neptune conjunction in the eighth. You know, a Neptune is allowing women to open their minds, open, imagine a different past, you know, imagine it in a different way and to imagine, you know, a future with different power relations. And it's looking beyond the patriarchy. So um, this uh, is uh, one of the uh, images from Punch at the time, and it's a Wiki Commons image. So, you know, the idea of women that wanted to be, uh, shall we say, liberated, that wanted to be, you know, independent, they were portrayed by the press. This is the, the suffragette, the new jiu-jitsu here, and all these men hanging off the railings. You know, they were, you know, this is Moon in Scorpio as well, you know, this sort of power that they, you know, can, you know, to actually bring about things. Um, but yeah, you know, she was portrayed as sexually frustrated and hysterical. And, you know, but actually a typical suffragette was also a vegetarian, an animal rights activist, and also a devotee of higher thought and of cosmic consciousness. So we get to people like, Pamela Coleman Smith, for example, who was a Golden Dawn member, but she was also a member of the Suffrage Atelier, which, uh, you know, she created women's art as suffrage propaganda, and she was jailed at least once for her suffrage activities. So feminist spirituality was very much linked with feminist politics, and we can see this um, as an ongoing theme in, you know, um, the idea of Mother Earth and protecting her and, you know, Axi, you know, I'm speaking Dutch now, Axi Fura, but, you know, um, fighting for the Earth, fighting for, is almost like fighting for the, for, for the feminine, for, fighting for the female. But this is, uh, yeah, this, we, you know, she's famous, of course, pa Pamela Coleman-Smith for materialising uh, Waits, um, Rider Wait tarot pack, she drew the cards. So um, now we get into the main course here, which is uh, uh, Pluto. Uh, so um, the court here, conspicuous by absence or a hidden presence. This is um, Joseph Campbell discussing Hades, Pluto. So, excuse me. So I think this idea of conspicuous by absence or, or a hidden presence is very much something that we could attach to the female story, to her story, if you like. Because as I said, this the original uh, title for this was what would Persephone say? Because when we look at the rape of Persephone, we know what Ceres did. We know what her reaction was. We know what Pluto did. He gave Persephone a pomegranate seed. We know what Zeus did. We know what everyone did. But the one person who is silence is conspicuous by absence or is a hidden presence in all of this is, of course, Persephone herself. So I think that is something that's really, uh, you know, really interesting in that statement that, that Joseph Campbell made, makes about Pluto. Or oh, Hades, actually, he's talking about. So... Um, so the three stages of emergence, the, the, this sort of like a challenge to the status quo, if you like, involve in my story of this with the discovery of the outer planets, Uranus, Neptune and Pluto. And I mean, obviously, it's a massive subject. It's just this is just like, you know, like chipping a little corner, if you like. It's a really tiny bit. This is a wonderful uh, image here of uh, the goddess Inanna, uh, which was actually on show. The actual tablet was recently, I went to London last year to see it. It was on show in the British Museum and it's, it's a phenomenally beautiful object. And you just think, how could it have survived? It's amazing. But anyway, Pluto Hades, this is James Hillman, Dreams of the Underworld. So he sort of tells us, you know, there are no temples or images to him, his name was rarely used. He was the unseen one. He was the hidden wealth of the invisible. And Pluto was often fused with Tanatos or death. You know, this idea of death also is the only God who does not love gifts and cares not for sacrifices or libations. He has no altars. He receives no hymns. I mean, I, I remember reading that if you wanted to get in touch or contact 
Pluto, then you would go to a wild place on a mountainside and you would beat the ground with your hands and fists and literally evoke him. And then I think, yes, then the ground opens and he comes in his chariot and, you know, down into the depths you do go. But anyway, all this negative evidence, Hillman says, does coalesce to form a definite image of a void. I love this. An interiority or depth that is unknown but nameable, there and felt, even if not seen. Hades is not an absence, but a hidden presence, even an invisible fullness. So when we start to think about uh, Pluto and, um, you know, how we could, you know, maybe, um, you know, have some kind of idea about the planet, I think Liz Green uh, says some things that I kind of agree with. You know, she sees Pluto as something feminine, primordial, and matriarchal. This is her writing in The Astrology of Fate, which is an amazing book on page 39. She says, I have had the feeling for a long time that Pluto symbolizes an archaic feminine power which has been excluded from religious worship for a very long time. Pluto heralds the death of religions and cosmologies and offers the same intense vision to replace them each time. And just to remind ourselves as well, this power that was being unleashed, the Third Reich was something that was being unleashed, the psychological power, the development of psychotherapy, power issues are very relevant as to the meaning of Pluto. Another amazing uh, look at Pluto, and this uh, is a talk I give um, about crossing, called Crossing the Rubicon, which you can still purchase from the CIA, which looks at Pluto's movement over the angles of the discovery chart. But Brian Taylor's essay, uh, it's quite a larger essay on the discovery of Pluto, an unbidden omen is, is just... It's just amazing. But he sees Pluto's discovery as a hidden omen. And he says that the 20th century is Pluto's century. It is linked to the transformation of a particular configuration of patriarchal power. Pluto rules taboo and it impels us towards areas which have been disowned. The regenerative power of nature, the spiritual and the material as in terra mater, Mother Earth. So Pluto is wealth and power and abuses of power. So, um, so it, astrologically, we know Pluto received dominion over the underworld. And this was a province that had previously been the dominion of various dark goddesses of the matriarchal uh, cultures. Astrologers correlated Pluto's discovery with a global depression, with the birth of depth psychology, gangsters, racketeering, fascism, so we know uh, the detonation of the first atomic bomb. So this is Demetra George in the Astrology of the Dark Goddess. So we're going to look at um, the discovery chart now of Pluto. Um, it's interesting, this um, idea of Mercury and Pluto in the chart is this sort of role that they have as cycle on both leading, you know, Mercury leads the, um, the souls into the underworld. It's the place of the setting sun. It's the descent into the darkness. In the chart, Mercury is angular and it rules the third house. And the ninth house is the god, the godhead, and the third house is the goddess in traditional astrology. And Homer describes the journey of the souls to the west. So look at the, that setting southern point. So Taylor talks about the angles as well as liminal locations, which are very important, and they absolutely are. The sun here is uh, in an anoretic degree in the chart, and Pluto is in the 12th. So this is the discovery chart for Pluto. And as you can see, uh, Venus is in the same position as in the discovery chart of Uranus, almost in the exact same position. Uh, it's two degrees. There's minutes in it. They're almost exactly conjunct. And the north, north, north nodes are the same, I believe, as well. And there, once again, we have in the fourth, this sort of strong sort of, you know, 
fierce moon in, in Scorpio, which is, if we think of the journey now as well with Venus retrograde of the journey into the underworld and the meeting with Erish Kigal, this is almost that in a way. Um, sun is in the eighth, right on the edge, moving out of Aquarius into Pisces, Venus exalted here, which is these two aspects of the feminine in a way, this sort of exalted goddess Venus in Pisces, the young woman, the beauty that, you know, and all that goes with it and the power that that bestows. And then this other sort of moon in Scorpio side. So it's a very, very powerful uh, chart. Um, let's see. What have I said about it? There are three T-squares in the chart. Chiron in the 10th is very interesting in this chart as well um, with regard to the emergence of um, shamanism and uh, that whole, um, you know, the sort of, uh, that whole movement that, that sort of arose through, um, what's his name now, Hana. We've got his chart in a minute. But there are three T-squares here. We've got... Um, this one with the Saturn Pluto to Uranus again. Uranus Pluto. It's a loose T square, but it's 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 approaching, it's applying, so it's it's quite powerful, I think. We've got the fixed one, which is Moon, Chiron, Mercury, and Mars. We've got the mutable one, which is Venus opposite Neptune square Jupiter. That's the mutable one, and then we've got. Um, very tuned in to the Saturn Uranus cycle. This is one of the closest aspects in the chart. So anytime Saturn Uranus are, you know, in hard aspect, there will be a, a general Pluto undertone, I think. And, you know, just this was manifested itself just four months after the Wall Street crash and the Great Depression that followed. So in the month of Pluto's discovery, Marlene Dietrich arrived in Hollywood. So this is an image uh, of her in the Blaue Engel, which was the uh, film she made in Germany. This is where she was sort of kind of almost in a way uh, discovered, Venus in Pisces. And the whole idea now starts to emerge of beauty as power. And we start to see the rise of the cosmetics industry, beauty in a jar. You know, the big uh, Estee Lauder, Helena Rubenstein, Max Factor, Factor, all of these um, um, uh, sort of big brands in the beauty industry uh, start to um, uh, yeah, come into the market, if you like, this selling this idea. Because you notice in the chart, um, the, the Sun-Venus conjunction, it's a separating conjunction, the actual Venus star point was in Aquarius some weeks before. So Venus is actually moving away from the sun. It's actually heading away. The conjunction has happened, shall we say. Um, but we start to see as well the emergence of androgynous women. Uh, this is uh, Marlene Dietrich. I think the film was Morocco, um, that she appeared, that you actually see her kiss a woman on the mouth in this very famous scene. But she's, you know, she's so masculine and feminine at the same time. So yeah, the myth of, and power of beauty starts to, um, you know, really, uh, yeah. So we see the arrival of pancake makeup, which was developed by Max Factor and trademarked in October, 1929, and the use of women to sell. This is Marlene Dietrich's horoscope, by the way. And uh, I mean, she is Pluto in the 10th. I mean, she's very, um, yeah, I mean, she's, uh, of course, she's a Capricorn, but what a, what, a, what a heap of planets in Capricorn and Aquarius. I mean, it's incredible. So she was very, very focused and she was very aware of her power as well. And she also has a Uranus opposition to Pluto close. And if you remember, Wollstonecraft had a very close Uranus square Pluto. So she's very insouciant, isn't she, Marlene Dietrich? You know, she doesn't give a damn about every, anything. She's, you know, she's, she's very, you know, sort of comfortable in her sexuality. But also published around the same time was this book by Mary uh, Esther Harding called Women's Mystery, Women's Mystery, sorry, Ancient and Modern. 
she was uh, she was born in the UK. She died in the UK as well, but spent a lot of her life in America. She's considered to be the person that took Jung to the States, actually. She studied with Jung in Zurich. And this book is a kind of a catalogue of myths and dreams that link women's, women's psyche to the moon. I think this was the spiel uh, on one of the, I think on Amazon or something. But the language of the book is so uh, fresh, almost. It feels modern. So she says, um, in the preface, the ancient, ancient religions of the moon goddess represent the education of the emotional life as taking place, not through a course of study, but through this um, initiation, you know, being initiated into something. And she talks in the book about the, the moon goddesses, the moon mysteries. You know, she's discussing Ishtar. She says she's the queen of the underworld. However, she became inimical to man and destroyed all that she created, you know, moon in Scorpio, maybe in an upper world activity. And in this phase, she was entitled the destroyer of life. She was the goddess of the terrors of the night, the witch, if you like, you know, the sort of Medusa, sort of the terrible mother, the giver. But she was also the giver of dreams and omens and revelation and understanding of things hidden. It's a really interesting modern feel to the text. And we also see the birth around the time of Plato's discovery of Michael Hana, who, um, who was an anthropologist who, uh, did a lot of research in uh, South America, and he really d brought shamanism into um, Western consciousness in a way through his work. And what's interesting, I think, with uh, core shamanism, the Harness School as well, one of the modules that you can do if you study there is, you know, the soul retrieval. And I find that very much about that underworld journey, which is very Plutonian, of course. Also in 1939, we see this book, and, and this is, was a book written by uh, Gerald Gardner, and he is a very important figure in all of this. Um, because at this point in the UK, and I'm not, not sure about the rest of the world, but I can imagine it being a similar story, witchcraft or anything like associated with that type of magic was against the law. So if you wanted to say anything about, you know, the goddess or this sort of, you know, you either could do it academically or in the form of a novel, which is what Gerald Gardner does in this uh, novel he published in 1939. It's set in Cyprus, which is where we know the goddess Aphrodite appeared on the shore. And he is, um, yeah, he, it's all, you know, about reincarnation, etc. But then we see in 1951, so this is, you know, not that long really after Pluto's discovery, we find the repeal of the Witchcraft Act. And Venus is conjunct with Pluto in that chart. So, and Venus, a lot of planets in June, Gemini, Sun at the edge there, and a retrograde degree, si trying the Sun in the Pluto discovery chart, by the way. So, the Witchcraft Act is repealed, and that allows uh, Gardner or gives him the opportunity to, um, I'm just gonna fly through these, to um, come out, if you like, in, in, in what he was doing. So he, he, was, yeah, he, was, uh, he was into witchcraft and he no longer had to hide it. He could really um, you know, hang it on the big clock, as we say in Holland. So this is Gerald Gardner, you know, he says, the witch goddess moon, thy spell invokes the ancient ones of night. Once more the old stone altar smokes, the fire is glimmering bright, scattered and few thy children be. Yet gather we unknown to dance the old round merrily about the time-worn stone. So Gerald Gardner um, was, um, Discovery Pluto is, by the way, Venus is here, uh, in, in, and it's square, his red, Radix Pluto in Gemini. So he's just born as Pluto has moved out of Taurus into Gemini. So he's one of these sort of transitional figures in a way, coming out of like everything sitting tight in Taurus into things starting to move a bit. The nodal axis of Venus is at 16 degrees Gemini Sag, and that's around his Saturn sun. This is a noon chart because I don't know what time he was born, but he was a Gemini. And he was yeah, considered to be enigmatic, mercurial, brilliant. He was a 
a really brilliant scholar, actually. He spoke many languages. He'd been involved in all kinds of um, cults and things. He was a, a, a Freemason. You know, he'd lived most of his life. He'd worked in Indonesia, so he knew a lot about the local faiths. And, um, yeah, he, he did a lot of archaeological digs. So he was he he had a huge um, sort of you know rucksack in a way of it of of, of knowledge when he retired and moved back to Britain. So uh, in, in in her book Joy Dixon's book The Divine Feminine, which I've used a lot in this talk, she mentions a dig in January 1936, which was 25 miles from Jer Jerusalem, which revealed a temple which was both to Yahweh and to a fertility goddess. So um, Gardner also meant Margaret Mead, the anthropologist, Alistair Crowley. So he, 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 was, he was just a, you know, a typical Gemini. He had a broad interest in, in, in everything. So, yeah, he came onto the BBC. And this is a time chart uh, because now, you know, witchcraft was allowed. He was practising. And we, I, I think there was only one channel in the UK at the time, which was BBC One. And Gerald Gardner does this big interview uh, on the television, on the BBC. And you can imagine, I mean, you know, everybody's tuned in. And he said it was like this massive advertisement for, you know, the witch for witchcraft. And as you can see, again, Pluto has just changed sign. Pluto has just moved from uh, Leo, it's, uh, sorry, from Leo into Virgo. So there's this shift here again. This Pluto movement, this seems to be rolling things out in a way. This is his uh, uh, um, foundational text for modern Wicca, because you know a lot of you've got the um, God, Gardnerian Wicca, you've got the Alexandrian Wicca. Alex, and the, the, I can't remember the name now, but the people behind the Alexandrian Wicca also studied with Gerald Gardner. So the whole Wicca thing was um, rolling out. Um, you know, from a, a lot of it was coming from this revival of witchcraft, which was taking place in the UK at the time. So this was considered, you know, the, the Book of Shadows, as it was called, was like a modern grimoire. So if you if you look at what his what this book was about, it was an eclectic mix of biblical verses, um, early it was in the Goetia, the Kabbalah, uh, books by Crowley, the Waitsmith tarot pack you know so there was a lot in there but the um the core of it was about you know the male female there's a lot of sex involved there by the way um you know all the rituals were taking place uh in the nude we see this with crowley as well it was more linked to the neptune discovery chart this idea of the sacred fluid you know which passed between a man and woman when they had uh, intercourse within a ritual setting because desire wasn't supposed to be playing a part in it. But uh, yeah, the, the, the rituals were very much, you know, tied to the old pagan year, you know, it's like, a, um, uh, you know, uh, anyway, let's keep on track here. So we have Doreen Valienti, who was um, his uh, student, and she took it all to the next level. Valiente was uh, much, um, she had a better way with words. She could, her, she rewrote the Book of Shadows. She just changed the language, made it more accessible. And she was, uh, she still is actually one of these people, a bit like, um, uh, what's her name? Dion, Dion Fortune is another one. You know, you have these females that were almost, and Blavatsky is another one, they're laying like really solid foundation stones in a way. And here you know, she's talking about the Aquarian age. So uh, Doreen uh, Valiente is um, a Capricorn. Uh, she, this is a moon chart as well. I have no time for her. And she's born uh, quite close uh, to the Jupiter-Saturn uh, conjunction, not in Virgo, uh, sorry, not in Lee, but the conjunction has already taken place in Virgo. But it's still, in a way, tuning in to the future, you know, the 1980 mutation conjunction of Jupiter-Saturn in Libra. You know, so she's a sort of harbinger, in a way, of things to come. She's sort of, yeah, that's how I see it in any way. 
she's definitely kind of ahead of her time as well. So um, just to mention, you know, that uh, that, that uh, Jupiter-Saturn conjunction in Libra, uh, which was in 1980, it was happening at the time of the Chiron return in the Pluto Discovery Chart. And I do find Chiron very much relates to shamanic uh, or, or ritual and, and, and magic, you know, the inner, the inner work, the inner journey. And what we saw around this time was a, things were happening that were a huge influence on um, new spiritual movements, particularly the idea of the goddess. So we have in 1979, 1980, we had Star Hawks Spiral Dance, which was in America. She was, she still is really big in America. We had uh, Elaine Pagel, the Gnostic Gospels, questioning, you know, the, the, you know, God the Father again, if you like. We had Margaret Adler, Drawing Down the Moon, Michael Hahn, a hugely important book, The Way of the Shaman. And all of these explore new spiritual paths, which are more closely attuned to the feminine, the intuitive, the mis mystical, while at the same time encouraging an interest in um, primal and pagan faiths. The term sacred feminine itself, or spiritually orientated feminism, was coined in the 70s. And so uh, about Hannah Graf uh, says that this is uh, the three domains of Wicca, the goddess movement and women's spirituality. And I find that as well. If you look up, you know, the, uh, the sacred feminine or women's spirituality, the goddess movement, you kind of, you know, see the same sort of um, vocabulary in a way, the same descriptions. So anyway, it's if we this is a citation from uh, Starhawk here. When she talks about the sacred feminine, she's talking about the calling forth of a power, which isn't power over, it's not domination. It's the power we sense in the seed and the growth of the child, the power we feel in writing, weaving, and creating. So, yeah, she was a leading, and still is, she's still alive, she's in Germany at the moment. She's a leading proponent uh, of a pagan uh, lifestyle, uh, also of um, earth conservation. She was, uh, this link of feminism and spirituality still exists. Starhawk was also very outspoken against, uh, you know, the development of uh, nuclear uh, weapons in America. Uh, she's just, she's just an activist all her life, really. Again, she's a Gemini um, with uh, Mercury, Mars. So quite often this is the south node, of course, of, uh, sorry, the north node of Venus is in, uh, in Gemini. Fascinating, fascinating woman. Venus conjunct Pluto in, uh, in Leo, in this case, trying Jupiter. So she's, yeah, she's, she's just, and Uranus in, in this chart has just uh, changed sign, has moved into Capricorn. So quickly, a few um, ideas that are coming out as well, that I think is interesting for where we are now, is this idea that, you know, <clears throat> we're Regulus shifting sign. So, um, you know, Vivian Robson mentions that when Regulus entered Leo in 293 BC, the power of Rome became fully established. But what we've seen since 1868, this is all based on Robson's book on fixed stars, we start to see um, the power of Regulus starting to be transferred to Virgo because it was in the last degree of the sign. And Regulus entered Virgo in 2012. So, and we're also, um, again, you know, when Regulus entered Leo, this was also kind of around the time when the age of Pisces was coming in. So there's a kind of a, an idea I have that maybe with Regulus changing sign now entering Virgo, as we move into this Aquarius age, we are having this sort of male, female sort of figure actually um, appearing, you know, uh, or coming to the foreground, you know. So that's kind of quite interesting, I think, especially when we think of Virgo mythology, because there is that link to Persephone, you know, um, speakers are bright as star. We've got this, I'm going to flick through this because it's time is running short, but you can look at it later with the recording. There's an image here of the um, of the uh, constellation, um, and we've seen as well. We can see this new these new things coming through, like veganism, for example. You know, this um, thrift management 
uh, the ancient grains back on the men, you know, buckwheat and canola and spelt. This is from Anthony Bourdain's uh, kitchen confidential here. Um, I mean, there's still a lot of meat, but there are, is less of it. It's, it's, it's sort of, we're becoming more earth conscious. We've also had things like the crop circles and the fact that they are now known to be fake. And it doesn't detract from the energy that surrounded them, the mystery that surrounded them when they started to first appear. They took people into the fields, back into the corn. There was a mystery there. And if we look at, you know, contemporary voices about divine feminine devotees, you know, we have somebody like Gabriella Herstic who writes for all the big magazines in America on the divine feminine, you know, like the cosmopolitan. She says it's a creative and life-giving energy within all of us that gives form to that which we care about. It's a way of aligning with the vibrant love of the universe and channeling it through your body into creating, connecting and loving because we all have a body. So the body, again, that's kind of quite sh shamanistic in a way as well, you know, that the body is something that we can journey into, you know, and that's also a sort of hidden sort of eighth house sort of sun sort of in, in the discovery Pluto. Or somebody like Edgar Fabian Frias, there is uh, no way to describe what is feminine as it means vastly different things to different people. So um, he, he says he thinks it's harmful to see the sacred feminine as only residing with people who were assigned female at birth. So there's a lot of things moving around now. So some final thoughts here now. Um, the Western mind, this is a citation from The Passion of the Western Mind by uh, Richard Tarnas. And he says that the Western mind has been founded on the repression of the feminine. But this separation necessarily calls for a longing for reunion with that which has been lost. And he goes on to say, the great challenge of our time, the evolutionary imperative is for the masculine to overcome its hubris and one-sidedness to its own unconscious shadow, thinking that eighth house Pluto, uh, sorry, Venus, Sun in the discovery of Pluto chart, you know, this shadow side, you know, that we have to enter into a fundamentally new relationship of mutual mutuality with the feminine in all of its forms. So the, the circle is round, we can say. You know, the goddess now has, has arrived. I mean, you know, if you type in the sacred uh, goddess or the divine feminine or <clears throat> anything like that. I mean, you're going to get hundreds and thousands, not only books, but also articles, uh, you know, look on Academia Edu, you know, it's it's everywhere. But, you know, so what comes next? You know, so, um, you know, the questions that are out there in the academic setting, if you like, is should women's spirituality even be feminine, you know? Uh, you know, the critics of the whole goddess uh, worship say, you know, it, it tends to lead women, for example, to valorize fertility and nurturance and other maternal qualities, you know, and the idea of the goddess is almost like, um, you know, it's, what is it, like substitutes, uh, you know, God the father, you know, for God the mother, you know, the great God who's the, there's sort of, you know, there's a lot of criticism uh, on the movement. You know, and there's also what we see in a way is, you know, the, the way that connection to earth, just as women are devalued, the earth too is devalued. So should women's spirituality be feminine? You know, the gendering of Mother Earth and female identification with her is almost like, a, you know, a mirror image in a way of man's superiority over nature, domination of the female. And if the earth is our mother, then how can we, you know, how can she protect? us if we were exploiting her. So the discovery horoscope of Pluto certainly points to a re-emergence of the feminine. It's a validation as well of female spirituality because one of the uh, women I quoted, I'm just going to nip back there, but for, if you look at Gabriella Herstic on Instagram and just look at the sort of images and how she is, I feel she's really sort of 
you know, claim in the moon in Scorpio as well. Her sexuality is really out there. She's sort of unashamedly, you know, she says, I'm not going to talk about having an orgasm. I'm going to talk about ascending. You know, it's, it's this kind of stuff. But she's an interesting figure. So, you know, there is, uh, you know, the sexuality, certainly if you look at 1960s and the pill and everything, you know, there is there is something happening, you know, but, uh, you know, the burning question is, what would Persephone say, you know? So uh, this is what I think, anyway, since the discovery of the outer planets, women have been trying to find a voice. We have been trying to find out who we are and start to find out what we want to say. And I think one of the uh, exciting things that is going on now is you know, all the time, we are recovering our histories. We're finding out about these amazing women who have done wonderful things. And you just think, why did I never hear about her when I was in, you know, history at school? What happened? What, you know, this idea as, um, you know, of hidden presence, you know, this sort of not being seen. And I think another issue that we have, if we like work with the Pluto discovery chart, which is, you know, I say progressively angles and planets over, because Pluto is now about to move over its discovery um, descendant. So it's moving for the first time now in, 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 since its discovery, it's going to move out of, because I think the descendant in Pluto discovery is something like three plus Aquarius. So Pluto is going to come out of this, house the six which you know in a way as well is about ritual magic and all of that is you know the sort of technique side of it is very six house it's moving above the horizon and it's not surprising is it pluto moves into aquarius and the big film of the year is um, all about oppenheimer and we're all once again seeing images of the bomb and the total destruction that goes with it it's not surprising that this is happening as Pluto now moves across or comes to move across um, the discovery descendant. So Pluto in, in the discovery chart at Venus, sorry, in, in, in Pluto discovery is exalted in Pisces. And we've seen how the uh, emergence of the makeup and beauty industry and what a pressure now that puts on women of all ages and it's particularly young women are susceptible to it. You know, uh, the nightmare of, you know, the beauty industry, this conform to the ideal, you know, of this gorgeousness that Venus in Pisces kind of represents. And so I think, you know, one of the things that was interesting, is I just saw Barbie on Sunday, one of the things I really, really noted in it were there was two cameos. And one of them in particular was interesting. It was set in a bus stop and Barbie is in the real world. And there's a, obviously an old woman sat in the same bus shelter. And there's a, a, a talk takes place between these two women. And at one point, Barbie says to her, you are beautiful. And her answer back is, yes, I know. And I just loved that. I thought it was, I thought, what are they trying to do? There was something in that movie that was very interesting. And I think that's one of the things, you know, uh, beauty is also a sort of culturally determined um, thing, if I can say that. So we need to challenge and look with different eyes and see beneath the surface, because that's Pluto as well. Pluto is not on the surface, it's under the surface, it's a deep dive. It's, you know, let's go meet Irish Kegel, right? That powerful Scorpio moon, which we see in all of the, um, all of the, the discover discovery of the outer planets. So yeah, I think every one of us, you know, you know, can answer that question, what would Persephone say ourselves, you know? I think every woman has a story to tell and every man too. So with that note, um, I ha think I am kind of coming to the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. That, that was a fascinating talk. My goodness, did we cover some ground there. And um, yeah, really, really interesting.